Hello, everybody. My name is Jim Anico. I'm one of the global board members of the International OWASP Foundation, and I'm a, I'm a trainer as well. But we're here for Confidence 2015. I'm glad you're here. I'm a little crazy, be warned. Please don't take any of these techniques and hack active systems without written permission to do so, or you're a freaking jerk and criminal. Thank you. So where are we going? We're going to talk about HTTPS. We're going to talk about TLS configuration, certificate pinning, forward secrecy, and strict transport security done right. There's only about 1,000 sites in the world that are doing strict transport security right. I'll help you be one of them if you pay attention. This is Nick Weaver, some random smart guy off of Twitter, and he's dead accurate when he says this. Any unencrypted traffic that's not using HTTPS or similar, it's not just a leak of data. It's an active attack vector for the attacker. They open up evil Wi-Fi, intercept HTTP, and what can they do? They can add any attack to that transport in either direction against your browser or the server. So HTTPS is something that we radically need to take seriously, and a lot of us are not doing that today. Hey, Bruce, Bruce is right too. Even though I'm going to talk about HTTPS, hopefully done right, Bruce is right. Cryptography is only truly useful if the rest of your system is sufficiently secure against the attackers. One little tiny XSS BS Game over. Who cares if you're using HTTPS? That's a rhyme. This is the man, Daniel Cuthbert. Cheeky bastard and super genius. And he said this to me just a few days ago, and he's right. When conducting a penetration test, I will break into your network and start sniffing traffic before I even take my pants off. The real lovemaking has not even started yet. He's right. So the point is, if, you, if a lot of people choose to not do HTTPS inside the network, They'll do it between the browser and the server, then everything else internal is plain text. Guess what attackers will do? They break in your network. One piece of malware that costs $19.95 on the open market is enough to sniff traffic and end your organization. So we've got to take this seriously. Thank you, Daniel. High five, cheeky bastard. All right, so let's jump ahead here a bit. Yeah, cryptography is not bypassed. It's often attacked, not attacked directly. We gotta stop using the term SSL because SSL is dead. What should we be calling this? This should be, of course, transport layer security. That's what we're gonna talk about today. And if you look at the history of, of SSL and TLS, we've only seen major uptick in the last couple of years. We had the era of Snowden recently, some revealing of secrets of, uh, um, of intelligence services that caused not just America, those Brits and some others were doing it as well, right? We have the Snowden relevations caused a relatively large uptick in SSL and TLS usage, and now we're entering the era of the internet of everything. Your toaster is now internet enabled, and the need for TLS and the use of TLS is rising dramatically. Let's become a part of that. So in a nutshell, SSL stands for Secure Sockets Layer. When they were inventing SSL 3.1, there was a copyright conflict with Netscape, so they just renamed it Transport Layer Security. Even though we shouldn't use SSL anymore, the difference between SSL and TLS is a name change and, a, and an upgrade to the protocol. So you'll see those terms used interchangeably, but who cares? Now, what is HTTPS? Is HTTPS a protocol in and of itself? The answer is no, it's not. It's two protocols used together. It's TLS or SSL if you're doing it wrong. It's TLS, uh, um, sorry, it's HTTP over TLS. It's two separate protocols being used together. So what's another way of looking at it? What benefits do we get when using HTTPS? When you get confidentiality, the adversarial spy on your network, they can't read any of your data or see any of your data. You get integrity. That means the adversarial spy on your network can't change your data without the protocol breaking in some way. But most importantly, not most importantly, but uh, one of the things I'll talk about is authenticity. When you go visit a website, you should know over HTTPS, you know for sure that's the right website. What system governs that? When you visit a website and your browser tells you that that's the real website, what system governs that authenticity? That would be the certificate authority system. What do you think of the certificate authority system, by the way, everyone? It is bullshit. Complete and utter bullshit. And I'm going to teach you how to detect when they do the bad things in just a moment. So TLS protocol. TLS itself is a combination of symmetric and asymmetric encryption, among other primitives in the world of cryptography. Why? Why is TLS used this combination of protocols? Because symmetric encryption is super fast, but we can't exchange a key over a public network. 
That's the whole point of asymmetric encryption. Now the two of us, over a public network with attackers watching us, we can exchange keys in public and build a, a secure two-way connection. That's the whole heart of asymmetric cryptography. But what's the point of it? I mean, what's the problem with it? It's super slow, a thousand times slower than symmetric crypto counterparts. So TLS, in a very, what I think is a very elegant, graceful way, they'll set up an asymmetric, slow, but, but publicly safe connection, then exchange key material and drop down to symmetric encryption, which is one key, but super fast. That's the heart of TLS, right? And we use certificates as part of the authenticity piece. So what should happen is when you're building your web server or one counterpart in a TLS connection, you build your own public-private key pair using some secure tool to do so. Then you take your public key and go to an authority. The authority will then take some money from you, maybe, identify, maybe check your ID, they'll take your public key, take the authority's private key, only a couple hundred of these in the world, and sign your public key and give it back to you. Now you have a public key to your server that's indeed signed by a certificate authority's private key, and where are all the public keys of these authorities live? Where do the public keys of certificate authorities live today? In your browser or wherever your client is. And so, you know, um, th th that's the key part because a private key will sign and a public key will verify that that signature was done correctly. So where should we use HTTPS? Everywhere. The era of HTTP is over. There is never a good excuse to use HTTP anymore. Stop using it. I'm talking about browser to server, load balancer to server, server to database, database to transaction, you to your business partner, server to server. HTTP is dead, stop using it. So we should be using it everywhere. And that's a very aggressive and expensive thing to say, but that's the world we live in. If you're not, you're done. So we're gonna look at different best practices in the world to accomplish these goals. I think the best guides for best practices come from Mozilla today. They'll actually let you pick in a configuration setting what's your OS, what kind of browsers do you wanna support, and a couple other issues, and, and they'll build a configuration file for you, saving you hundreds of hours of trying to configure your server properly. So there are a lot of things that are gonna help you to do this correctly. So where, where should we do HTTPS? Say it. Where should we do HTTPS? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Everywhere what? All right, you're out. <laughs> Security, get him. No, no, no. Uh, you may stay. We'll come back to you later. <laughs> How do we get this right? So number one, update your OS to the latest patch level. Yeah. If you're using Apache 1.3, if am I allowed to swear in here? Thank you. What the fuck are you doing? This is end of life in 2010. Yet tons of you are still using Apache 1.2 and Apache 1.3. So if you're using Apache 1.3 today, I give you permission to go now and go update to Apache 2.2 or 2.4. This will at least open, um, update OpenSSL. It's going to fix numerous problems. Hi-fi, Nick Allbreath, wherever you are, right? And so all these versions of SSL and TLS, everything that's not TLS is broken. We saw Matt and uh, Jonathan talk about several different attacks against HTTPS, very well described. And th these are real world issues. So the minimum you should be using is at TLS 1.0. If you're doing intra-server communication, that's mutual TLS, then you should be doing a 1.2 with a really single strong cipher suite for both servers. I digress. So what do developers do wrong? Developers use HTTP for any reason that's wrong. Now the only time I'll let you use HTTP, I dare say, I make the first request to your server HTTP. That's usually a bad sign in the first place. You then 302 redirect me to HTTPS and everything redirects to HTTPS. So again, we really need to minimize or avoid the use of HTTP. I'm gonna just jump ahead here, make up a little bit of time. Beast, crime, breach, heart bleed, poodle, freak. You know, the, and, and uh, you know, Matt, Matt and Jonathan talked a lot of these. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move ahead a little bit. Poodle is very interesting. My take on how to, how to weaponize a poodle attack is I'll set up like a pineapple in a legal ethical test. A pineapple is a cheap Wi-Fi, lets me do man in the middle over HTTP in a trivial fashion. So if I have a pineapple, you connect to it, I'll route you through the real internet, and any HTTP connection, I can inject whatever content I want in to that connection. So what I can do is I can drop some JavaScript in, which will then start making requests to the server I'm trying to attack, 
and, and using a padding attack, like was described earlier. And after about 4,000 requests or so, I can steal the session cookie, hijack that account, game over, right? And two of the things you can do is disable SSL3 everywhere, right? Disable SSL3 everywhere and make sure it's on the client and server disabled. There's also a new config setting, the TLS fallback setting, which will prevent these town, which will, which will limit some of these downgrade attacks. And so the other big problem is the browser failing open. What do users do when they see SSL TLS errors in the browser? They, 30 to 70% per different studies I've seen will skip right through it. So we really can't depend upon the browser to save us. We have got to get this right ourselves on the server. Now, the, the, the key part of, the key part of HTTPS that's been under fire lately, not just the crypto, but the authority system itself. When the authority system goes belly up, it allows very advanced threat agents to man the middle any client or any, any client server connection relatively easy, to be honest with you. So Trustwave is a certificate authority. Back in 2012, they took their private certificate as an authority, put it in an HSM, and sold it for profit. What if I gave you a private key of a, of a certificate authority? What could you do with that? Everything. You can make, well, not everything. <laughs> this is science now. <laughs> Get out. What you can do with it, you can, if you're, a, man, if you're a, a network appliance between two connections, you can essentially make any fake certificate, make a fake certificate to yourbank.com and then uh, sign it with this authority. What does the browser do if you give it a fake fraudulent certificate to a website, but it's signed by a real authority? What does your browser say? Everything is, everything is awesome. Give them the data. This is foolish, first of all. The, I mean, Chrome, I think, has done a, lot of, done a lot of good things to improve security, but they have a long way to go before we have a real secure client. Somebody build me a good, secure browser, you know, and, and it'll, it, the, the market needs it desperately, I, I dare say, right now. So next, December of 2012, the Turkish government began issuing fake certificates to Gmail and Google services that weren't the real Gmail certificates. They were, they were signed by the Turk Trust Authority, and Google caught them doing this. Why would the Turkish government ever issue fake certificates to Gmail that were signed by a real authority? What were they doing? What were they doing? Eavesdropping. They, they were spying. Eavesdropping is nice. I'm not a very nice person. They were spying bastards, and they did it poorly. But what happened was Google, without telling anyone, implemented certificate pinning. Now, what's certificate pinning? This is when it's a key continuity scheme. This is when you take uh, for one way of doing pinning is you take a copy of the public key from Gmail, and, the, and this is what Google did. They took their public Gmail cert and they hard coded it in the browser. So whenever you went to visit Gmail, if the public cert you got back from a TLS connection wasn't the exact match hard coded in the browser, Google would complain and say you're being man the middle by a pretty savvy authority, by a pretty savvy threat agent. They would and they would send a message from the browser back to Google to inform Google that this happened. So when Google caught Turk Trust making fake certificates, what did they do? Quietly say something? No, they blogged about it. And so, but this blog post was a warning to the world's intelligence services, governments, and hackers saying, hey people, we're doing certificate pinning for all of our services now. If someone is using Chrome or Firefox and they mail in the middle of us with, a, with, a, with an authority-based attack, we're going to know about it, so stop doing it. So then a year later, December of 2013, the French government, through their cybersecurity agency, you're not going to believe this, the French were issuing fake certificates to Gmail signed by the, signed by the uh, French cybersecurity agency. Liberty! Why would the French government issue fake certificates to Gmail signed by the French authority? They were spying. And so what happened? So Google almost immediately revoked the French government from the browser. A couple days later, um, Mozilla, Microsoft, and Opera did the same thing, effectively knocking France, or at least the France cybersecurity agency, out of the browser altogether. What did the French say? It was a configuration error. <laughs> Bullshit. So why did the, the, we knew about this. Why did the French do this in December of 2013? I'm gonna tell you why. The French were focusing on fresh croissants, art, architecture, poetry, wooing women, Paris, flowers, dance, but they weren't doing their freaking homework in basic computer science. That's why.
moving on. Next, we're looking at February of 2014. Let's go back to America. Let's go to Cupertino, where we see this massive, massive bug that didn't hit the news enough, CVE-2014-1266. This is the famous Apple go-to-fail bug announced during a down news cycle, which lets anybody man the middle, any iOS or OSX connection over HTTPS with a two-year window before we found out about it. Here's the code. Where's the bug? Oh, wait, 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 wait. Watch the bug, upper right hand corner, watch the bug. Are you ready, are you ready? Wiggle, 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 wiggle. <laughs> yeah. Where's the bug? Code review, get to it. Where's the bug? Say it, say it. The second go to fail. Look at the two lines of code under the second go to fail right here, right? This is what you call dead code, it never happens. My compiler from bleeping 20 years ago would catch dead code. This is either completely gross negligence from the largest companies in the world, or it was a back door. When it's the morning, fresh birds and sunshine. My wife hands me my first coffee of the morning. I just think it's a bug. When it's late at night, I've had a few beers. I'm very tired. It's a back door. So. Heartbleed. You already heard about this? I'm going to explain Heartbleed by cartoons. Hey, server, are you still there? Give me potato with six letters. Potato. Hey, server, are you still there? If so, give me bird with four letters. Bird. Hmm. Hey, server, are you still there? If so, give me hat with 500 letters and now scraping your RAM anonymously. Game over. So this is a sim and the thing is, this is a joke. This is a buffer overflow. We've known about this for years. Most compilers have, have compiler tool chain hardening flags to detect this. So this is a horrendous bug which demonstrates very poor assurance. I'm glad Heartbleed happened for one reason, because all of a sudden all the world's companies that depend upon this library, they finally started funding OpenSSL to do better assurance. So now there's millions of dollars flooding into OpenSSL to do static analysis, uh, dynamic analysis, design review, manual code review, the basic security assurance we need to build and maintain secure software. So a lot of good did come out of this. So now let's get even more hardcore. Chrome's going to start making HTTP sites insecure by default. Look at this little tiny lock here. In Canary right now, anytime you visit an HTTP site, the Chrome will flag it as being insecure. This is a very minor visual change that's going to have radical effect in terms of uh, support call rises and, and people questioning why, the, why a site's being flagged as insecure. Chrome, Google is also prioritizing HTTPS results in their search engine, trying hard to force everyone to move to HTTPS. The goodness of Google is well debatable, but I think the moves like this are good use of their power, I dare say. Yeah, Ruby's broken too. All right, moving on, moving on. So what are the big excuses why we shouldn't do HTTPS? Now's your last chance. Give me an excuse why HTTPS should not be done in some way. Go ahead. What's your excuse? Well, my issue What's your excuse, not Mr. Spock? Not mine. Just my customers say that. Oh, then the caching on the servers is really difficult, and then the servers slow down. Oh. And can't do anything. You can do, you can do gateway-based review. Know, you can do client-based solutions. That's a lazy argument, but it's a fair one. I agree. What's the other excuse we hear? What's that? Then use, di then use European standards. That, that's, a, that, that's a matter of changing a string in a text file to adjust if you don't want to use NSA. Buy certificates. Who you buy certificates from doesn't really matter. We'll look at that in a second. It doesn't matter if you use a Swiss certificate. If any authority goes bad, you're done. So using a trusted authority gives you very little benefit, to be honest with you. The trick is to do certificate pinning so you detect when they go bad. We'll get to that in just a moment. What other, what other excuses do you have for not using HTTPS? What else? Bring it on. What's that? That's not true. You can do it both on client and gateway solutions. What else? Give me a better, give me a better one. Performance. What's that? Performance. Performance. That's not true either. HTTPS is faster than HTTP. Go look at the Is TLS Fast Yet project. When you're using proper configuration, HTTP 1.1 and the Speedy protocol, your use of HTTPS is significantly faster and more performant than crappy old HTTP. It's true. How about certificates are too expensive? If you think buying a certificate for your server is too much of a cost, that makes you what I call a CB, called cheap bastard, right? 
And so plenty of, it does break caching and filtering, but guess what? When you do HTTPS strongly and it breaks caching, guess what that means to the attackers trying to break your connection? It's tough for them too. That's the whole point of doing this right. So, and, and this is not just my ideas. Go look at the chromium.org, chromium security, making HTTP as non-secure. It shows you all these excuses and how they've been addressed in the real world from a science point of view. How do we improve this? How much time do I have, by the way? Proctor, Proctor. Hello? 15 minutes, thank you. Let's do this. Let's get it right. Who cares about the problems? Those are fun. These are not as exciting. But if you want to learn how to do HTTPS correctly, hang on for about 15 minutes. And so let's do this. All right, so HTTPS, strict transport security. This is step number one. What, what strict transport security is, it's a response header. When someone makes an HTTPS connection to your server, you can add a response header to that response, strict transport security for a max age number of seconds and include all subdomains. This is a browser initiative and standard that says the browser will never make a request that's HTTP to your site. So if some attacker tricks you into redirect or if the user types in HTTP to your site, it will actually flip it to HTTPS and then make the connection. This is a fantastic idea. Now, if you do strict transport security by itself, it's very easy to get this wrong. Now, hello, sister. The, 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 yeah, strict transport security. This is Jerry Hoff, did a YouTube video, really well done, finely produced video. I highly recommend you look at that. This forces the browser to make HTTPS connections. It must initially be delivered over HTTPS in the first place. Now, what's wrong with this standard? It must be delivered over HTTPS. When one of your users opens up a browser for the first time, what do they normally do to make the initial connection? They usually make an HTTP connection to your server first. They just type in your domain, that's HTTP, and it comes back, um, and then they redirect you to 302, redirect you to HTTPS, and now you're HTTPS. So the user goes plain text, plain text, HTTPS, strict transport security. If you're an attacker on the network and you see the initial HTTP connection, what is it? It's game over, man. It's totally game over. So how can we stop even that first hop from being HTTP? This is called the HT HSTS preload list that's supported by Chrome, Firefox, the Chromium project, and pretty much every other browser agrees to this. Once you have strict transport security in place, in your server, once you have HTTPS everywhere, once you have your strict transport security header time to be 18 weeks or longer, you can then go to the Chromium open source project, submit your site, and Chrome will hard code your site into the, into the browser. Firefox, other browsers are picking it up. That way, someone grabs your browser for the first time, they hit your site for the first time, Chrome has you preloaded, literally hard coded in the source code, so it will switch even the first connection to HTTPS. You get this right, it's gonna be very almost impossible for a user to make an HTTP connection to your site. For more information, go look at um, hstspreload.appspot.com or dev.chromium.org, part of the open source version of Chrome. I'm incredibly impressed with this initiative. And by the way, this does not scale very well. Do you care if it scales? Uh, my take on this is, I don't care if it scales, I just care if it works for my sites and my customers. <laughs> And it does. It's going to work for you. You have to submit your site, wait a few months for it to roll into production. The power is pretty significant. So I'm going to skip a few slides to make a little bit of time. La, 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 la. Cookies, cookies. Brow this is the, these are the browsers that will actually support strict transport security. IE 12, they're late as usual. Firefox 29, pretty reasonable. Opera 12, who cares about Opera? Safari 7, it's in Chrome. Right, let me move on before I make fun of Opera anymore. Last note, certificate pinning. So here's fancy graphics, certificates flying, more certificates flying, yeah, certificates flying, evil servers coming into play. Oh my God, evil servers, this is so awesome. More certificates flying, evil servers are back. Go, oh, come on, let's move, let's move, come on. Okay, good, here we go. Certificate pinning. Certificate pinning, again, is a key continuity scheme. It's basically either hard coding the certificate from the server into your client, or it's trusting the first client delivered. For example, this is how SSH works. You make a connection over SSH, 
You're given the public key to that server, and most clients will pin that certificate, where if you make a connection back to that server and the same client, and the certificate changes, your SSH client will complain that you're being man the middle as it should. That's called tofu pinning, trust on first use certificate pinning. The other better form of pinning is to carry around a copy of the server's public key. And you can do this easily in a mobile application. You can do this easily in a thick client application. And using the experimental HPKP, this is a public key pinning API inside of Chrome, you can experiment with this. This is where you get bit doing this though. Suppose your certificate is gonna expire in two weeks and you then pin a user cert for two months. What did you just do? You just denial of service to your users. So be careful, what I, you, and you can pin multiple certs. My discipline that I recommend is about a year before my cert expires, I get a new cert and pin it. So when, the, when, I, when we pass the ex cert expiration boundary, I already have a cert in play. Even better, if you're really hardcore, if you really care about uptime, cert in the orange. Do you care about uptime? Do you, do you, do you? you and he cares about uptime. Let's help him out. So what you do is assume your authority's gonna go bad. I know you pick a Swiss authority and the Swiss are awesome, but who knows what could happen, right? So you get a, you get a cert from two different authorities you, and you pin them both. You get another cert about a year before expiration and pin that too, get in this discipline every year and now you have, you have all your backup for uptime ready to roll and things go bad. And so, so this is tricky to use, it's tricky to get right, but the power is dramatic. How does this work? Again, when someone man the middles you and they issue a fake certificate with a real, properly signed uh, signature from the authority. Well, what happens? Hello. We are we doing film or are we doing pictures? <laughs> film. I prefer I prefer pictures. <laughs> do, you, do you have a camera? Do you have a camera? Let's let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Back to work. Come on. We're not done yet. So when, when someone man the middles you, they give you a fake cert signed by a real authority, the client sees that it's not matching what they have hard coded and they freak out and say you're being man the middle and drop the connection. That's what should happen. This way, regardless of what authorities you trust, what matters is when you see a change and you detect it and then you, then you can inform yourself that this happened. You have a report URI that will then report URI, that will send a message back to you that tells you when this event happened on the client. This is how Google trapped Turk Trust and the French government when they were man the milling their populace in some way, right? And here's some openness, I'll, I'll come to publish this presentation, so here's some headers to make your pinning, e your pinning config easy through OpenSSL. And this is what Chrome does when it detects that, that the pinning has been broken. Attackers might be trying to see your information from Google.com, for example, passwords, messages, or credit cards. And if you click through that, there's no hope for you. So let's, let's move, move ahead a bit. Now this, this really bothers me a lot. When I, 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 I wept many tears when I saw this, really. So we saw the attack recently uh, that Robert Graham posted uh, about uh, an attack against uh, Loveno machines, Leveno, whatever you want, to, however you pronounce them. So some some advertisement company uh, basically got to, got to pre-install some adware into your machine before Loveno was sent to you. They actually installed a local authority in the browser. There's two kinds of authority. There's internet class authorities and a locally installed authorities. And when someone can install a local authority into your browser, what does that mean? That means all the pinning APIs are skipped. So you want to do uh, network inspection to all of your users in your company, you can have a private authority, put that private authority cert in all your employees' browser and man, man the middle of them ethically, whatever, right? But that's how you do it today. I think that when anyone is man milling my Gmail or similar services, I want to know about it. So I really, I really implore you to look at this, these series of postings from Robert Graham. They show you how a local authority breaks the whole security model of the browser on purpose so companies can do security work. Now Google said, and I got really mad when I saw this, I'm like, you're kidding me, you're getting man the middled by this, by this malware and you never told anybody about it? They're like, well, we don't respect the local threat model. We can't stop local attackers. But not only is Google not protecting local attackers, not trying to stop local attackers, they're making it easy for them. So I challenge that notion. Read this, it's very critical to see the edge of where HBS fails where we really have no, no way to solve it today, unfortunately. Last note, perfect, how are we on time? 
last note, we have uh, perfect forward secrecy. And I'm going to go through this kind of fast, right? When you have perfect forward secrecy ciphers, now, before this, when you were using RSA for the most part to do the key exchange, if I, if I couldn't attack the crypto as an attacker, I might just record your traffic, record the traffic for years. And I might not be able to break that crypto, but if I can someday steal your private key on your server, I can decrypt any traffic I ever recorded off that server because the symmetric key for encryption was derived from the, uh, from the public key on your server. And that's a, a th for the private key on your server. Let me say that again. The symmetric key in your connection the symmetric key was derived from the private key on your server. If that private key gets stolen, any recorded traffic is broken. Enter ephemeral cipher suites. Uh, uh, what this cipher suite does is it does the key exchange in a temporary way. The actual symmetric key negotiated for encryption is temporary, ephemeral, and it goes away quickly. So if an attacker brute forces your key, they get a little bit of your message and have to keep brute forcing. So it stops the passive attacker why it's such a benefit. Let me jump ahead and here's some pretty graphics. And th this is actually kind of cool. Stop using RSA. Stop using Diffie-Hellman. We saw why Diff we, we've been saying stop using Diffie-Hellman for a while. And by the way, you saw the new attack recently. If you're still using export keys from 20 years ago, you're, you're done already. So I think that was kind of a BS attack, but it's interesting research. More death to legacy HTTPS connections. Stop using RSA for everything. I recommend elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman, and I know you're going to give me the whole elliptical curve NSA backdoor to debate, I know. Uh, if you know of anything better, I'm welcome to suggest it. There are plenty of alternatives to elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman if you think it's backdoored. I, I, I highly doubt it is. There's a lot of research going into trying to find that. Um, we'll find out soon enough, I guess, maybe. Um, we should be using AES pretty much for everything. If you're paranoid, go ahead and use Camellia for Europe, right? We should be using SHA-256 as well. If you're paranoid in Europe, go ahead and use Whirlpool. So you have alternatives to these if you don't like US or US driven standards. And I don't blame you if you don't. It's a, it's a very debatable topic. Stop using SHA-1 for anything. Please retire RSA. And a call to action here. Are you ready to receive? Number one, strict transport security. Force the browser to use HTTPS and also do the preload initiative to make sure that even the first hop to your server is forced by the browser to be HTTPS. Even when a user types in HTTP to your server, let's make it HTTPS. Number two, pin everywhere you can. Detect when someone gives you a fake certificate that's signed by a real authority. There's a very basic old school crypto key continuity scheme. It's a little tricky, but it's doable. By the way, anybody in this room hired to do easy things in their job? We are engineers. We're hired to do the tough stuff. So if you balk at this, this is too tough, you, there's librarian job. There's, uh, I'm, I'm not even going to insult the librarians. I take that back. I love librarians. So let's move on. And yes, you should choose your authority wisely, but don't depend upon that because it's not your authority going bad that's going to hurt you. It's any authority going bad. So if I get any private key of any authority, I can make fate certs and man in the middle of you pretty easily if you're not doing pinning. I'm going to skip stamping. So let's look at forward secrecy. We want to stop passive attacks as well and get away from RC4 and RSA and use modern ciphers in some way. That's it. I'm going I'm to leave this in the deck. If you want to talk about revocation, stop using certificate revocation lists. They don't scale. There's a whole different, nice pictures, certificates flying. So what's the conclusion here? Summary, Cam where's the cameraman? Get the cameraman. We need him for a second. Cameraman, what is SSLH? Everyone get your camera out real quick. We talked about HTTPS, talked about TLS configuration, talked about certificate pinning, looked at forward secrecy, Talked about strict transport security. This is my hero, Ivan. Oh, Ivan. Pictures now. I don't like to recommend commercial products. SSL Labs is so far ahead of everyone's research. It's a public free service. It's a nice, cheap, and it's a free and easy way to check the uh, strength of your public facing server. They do not harvest your data to do sales. It's just an open free service per contract with Ivan and his employers. I'm a big fan of this because it's open and free. And it's extremely useful without over commercializing the service. It's called SSL Labs. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We do one, let's do one question. One, give me one question. What do you got? One question. Go. Second. If 
So mentioned that uh, HTTPS with speed is faster than HTTP. Yeah, it, the site is is tlsfastyet.com. It's a very extensive research there. That, that's, that's the answer yeah, to your question. But, but go ahead. Uh, I remember that sp speedy in some uh, combination with, I don't remember, TLS or SSL has some uh, vulnerability. Go to istlsfastyet.com. <laughs> okay. They'll give you a detailed map of which protocol, which server will work and which will not, which version you need. I don't have that to memory. That's your answer. Okay, thanks. That's it? HTTPS where, everybody? Everywhere. Everywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you.